Hey everybody, this is Wendy here. Let me just make sure I get this into full screen. So we're trying to do, get this all into full screen. So hey everybody, really good to see you all. I've been missing you in the classes. So uh, yes, we've, we've missed uh, March 30th class and I think uh, at least one here in April. So what we've all decided to do with the school district is, is here with Parent University. If you remember, this is, these are the classes and on my website we also have the listing of the class dates. I have been, uh, we're doing virtual now in lieu of the classes. So what I'm going to be doing is a series of videos and I'm going to be doing them on dress for health success, which is what you see here on the screen and the D stands for diet. R is rest, E is exercise, S is stress and supplements. So what we're going to be looking at, especially in the times that we're in right now, where, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of stress involved. And, you know, it's easy to uh, get overwhelmed and to get off of track with diet. So I'm just going to do some overviews and keep this really short, hopefully short and sweet, you know, how we go. Anyway, so I'm Wendy McPhail. Um, I am a clinical nutritionist. I'm also a functional, an FDN, which is a functional diagnostic nutritionist and a colon hydrotherapist. I'm a Ad ADAPT certified health coach. And um, this has been my field for almost 20 years. So again, I just want to read that this information is not medical advice. It's not intended to replace the advice or attention of healthcare professionals. Consult your healthcare practitioner before beginning or making changes to your diet or exercise program or for diagnosis or treatment of your illness. So um, what we're going to be talking about in this one, this particular module number one is diet. So I want to just go over here, three major dietary triggers and toxins. And, you know, I can go on and on about diet and how to eat. But if we're just going to talk about basically three diet fails that most North Americans are doing, we, we pretty much we have a lot of fast food. We have a life uh, that we all grow up in here. And there's three sort of major triggers, triggers and toxins that can turn inflammatory. So what is inf inflammation in our bodies? Inflammation is usually the precursor to disease. Now, everybody's genetics are different. So however long we're, we're in an inflammatory state until it turns to disease would be different with every person. There are genetics involved as well. But we're just going to be talking right now about diet only. And I have chosen three aspects of health, three aspects of eating that most, if most of us actually aren't thinking about unless, you know, you've been really uh, coming to a point in your life where you've gotten into the things pretty deep because we all have info on health. We all like to think that we're health minded and we understand things. So this dietary overview, as it says here, I'm going to discuss three dietary trigger foods that are, we are faced with every single day and how they affect our overall body inflammation. As we know, inflammation is the root of all of all disease. So dietary triggers are foods which can severely impact your health. They break down into a toxic environment in our bodies. And at the simplest level, a toxin in our body can cause disease or damage tissue. Usually tissue damage, uh, similar to small intestine, something like SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, can turn into, over time, an inflammatory condition that then turns into autoimmune disorders or different diseases, eventually, maybe finally, uh, turning into cancer. Now, there are some things that come from outside our bodies can affect us that way. As we know, different cancers can be formed by environmental poisons that people unknowingly partake of, and that can turn to cancer. But today, we're just talking about um, food right now and diet. The primary effect toxins have on our body, whether dietary or otherwise, is inflammation. We're either infl in, we get inflamed from outside, or we get inflamed from what we're eating on the inside. Now, this is a really favorite little quote. It's the small, consistent things that we do every single day, these little choices we make that literally determine if we're going to have a long and healthy life. I think a lot of us grow up with, well, we're going to do a cleanse. We're going to do this. We have little times every year. Maybe we do cleanses, but it's really a daily thing, what we're eating that really counts. And I love this quote here. The first bite eaten of any toxin has low toxicity. You might eat it once or twice and say, hey, I did okay with that. But each additional bite is slightly more toxic than the bite before. At higher doses, the toxicity of each bite continues to increase so that the toxin is increasingly poisonous. Now, if we're talking about something, for instance, like gluten and someone's intoler not tolerating it, the first time you eat it, the second time you eat it, in the initial, in the, in the beginning, the body is just, you know, really coming in and, and trying to fix 
every single time trying to fix it after you eat it. But you can imagine once you eat something enough times or do something enough times that the body just can't keep up. And after a while, the toxins from the offending food are going to be stronger than what the body can do to actually help you. And this is what happens with most people. Uh, they can eat something for a while and then all of a sudden they can't eat it. So most people will not develop health problems by eating a small amount occasionally of these three dietary triggers, triggers that I'm going to do here, cereal grains, industrial seed oils, and fructose and sugar. So most people having tiny amounts of this here and there, not going to really affect you very badly. But the majority of our population eats these three dietary toxins multiple times in every day. So the primary effect toxins have on the body, again, is inflammation. You're going to see this word inflammation highlighted here in bold through most of my PowerPoint. So if we're looking at chronic inflammation as the hub of the wheel here, and we're looking at a wheel with spokes, you can see that chronic inflammation in the body can really affect every aspect of your health. Some of it's going to be genetic, where some of us are more predisposed to have something when we're chronically inflamed, inflamed, it might go somewhere before another area. For in my case, it was breast cancer. But uh, as you can see, we're looking at the hub of the wheel, and this is inflammation. And, and uh, we're talking about diet today. These are food choices and things we're doing quite regularly that turn into a chronic state in the body, which then eventually affects all these other ways. Now, here's what's interesting. Chronic inflammation begins in the gut. and We've all heard about leaky gut syndrome and SIBO and SIFO, so small intestine bacterial overgrowth, small intestine fungal overgrowth, uh, it becomes a condition in the gut. Because where does the food go first, really? When you eat it, it's going to be the GI tract that gets that food first. And that, that is the first area that's going to be, become inflamed. And it's interesting how it can travel through that leaky gut, basically through the inside of the gut wall, directly into the bloodstream and then it can overwhelm the body via the bloodstream that way and it's interesting and when you look at this chronic inflammation you have at the top all cancer station stages initiation progression and metastasis metastasis cancer you have neurological diseases depression alzheimer's parkinson's multiple sclerosis you have diabetic complications of neuropathy retinopathy uh, hypertension atherosclerosis, heart disease, you go down into pulmonary disease, COPD, asthma, hay fever, uh, bone and joint disease, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, all of those. You go into metabolic disorders of both types of diabetes, fatty liver disease, renal. You get over here to autoimmune disorders, IBD, Crohn's, colitis, lupus, MS, uh, type 1 diabetes, cardiovascular disease. You got strokes, heart failures, hypertension. I mean, you can really see how big this inflammatory condition can become. Uh, so uh, if you know my story a little bit, I had fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, lupus, MS. These were four autoimmune disorders I was diagnosed with probably over about a 12-year period. And it got to the point where I was more and more debilitated and, and bedridden. I did end up on four different prescription drugs. This was the 90s. And in those times, we didn't have a lot of the info we have out there now. We had dial-up internet. I wasn't able to get a lot of info. And I just I just didn't understand the root of things. And eventually, I did have breast cancer in 2004 into 2005. And so, um, you know, I, I look now at my story, and I see the chronic inflammation. I see the way it began. I see how everything started. And some of it was unintentional. Most of us don't have any idea this is all going on. So what I'm trying to give everybody is a heads up, looking at these three things that can really create chronic inflammation in the body. The first one, number one I'm doing is cereal grains. What are cereal grains, right? Wheat, corn, rice, barley, oats, rye, and millet. All the cereal grains, they become staple crops in the human diet. The big agricultural revolution, uh, when we started having, you know, fields that could be taken, you know, we had... We, we were able to, to take out the crops and get them into stores. I mean, the 50s and the 60s, this was a big time. And I think in the last 60 years that cereal grains have become one of the most highly recommended foods, even on our, our pyramid of health. I think most people get up in the morning, maybe have a bagel, maybe at some point midday they're having maybe a salad, but they've got a bun. You're going to have something with it. Then at dinner, you might have pasta. And there's a constant, most people are eating grains pretty constantly in a day. So most people think that whole grains are healthy. Most grains, though, uh, with indigenous tribal people in all the tribal and, and different uh, places of historical writings, we know that they soaked and sprouted and fermented all their grains, seeds, and legumes prior to eating. I think nowadays all people are really thinking about is, is it, is it organic, really? It's not GMO or something. But you got to understand that grains and these issues go deeper than just that. 
So cereal grains are carbohydrates which break down to glucose. Why should we monitor our carbohydrate intake? Because all carbs are converted by our bodies into sugars, into glucose, which is used for energy. As glucose can't stay in the bloodstream for too long, our pancreas produces insulin, allowing glucose to be distributed to our cells to burn as energy for various functions. The majority of people do not burn off all of our glucose consumed in our diet, and we're eating a lot of grains, like we're having pasta, we're having bread, we're having cereal, and we're usually having them daily. So all of this glucose ends up getting stored as glycogen to be used by our muscles and liver, and the rest ends up as triglycerides or fat in the fat cells. That's when we get that visceral sort of big, big tummy, the big waste that we get. Um, and we end up with insulin resistance, weight gain, obesity, prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, and some cancers. The key is not to eliminate carbs altogether, but to consume lower amounts and to choose the types of carbs that are going to release insulin slower, also known as low GI MAP foods, keeping us satiated for longer. So wheat, most of us have heard of celiac. It's a condition of severe gluten intolerance. This condition can be dramatic in people. A toxin called gluten, which is a protein and peptide, is present in wheat and many of the most commonly eaten cereal grains. And by the way, corn has something called zine. Uh, oats have something called zonulin. There's many kinds of peptides that are in other grains that might not be gluten, but still do great damage to the intestinal tract that we that we don't realize is happening. So gluten does damage the intestine and makes the lining leaky. That's what we were talking about. A leaky gut is one of the major predisposing factors for diabetes and obesity. What is less known is that wheat gluten and these peptides trigger an immune response in our bodies and gut inflammation in almost everyone, even if you are not gluten intolerant. Um, if you don't have a celiac and you might think, well, I'm fine, but over 80% of the population develops measurable gut inflammation after eating wheat gluten. So increasing numbers of scientists and medical professionals are beginning to make the connection between modern wheat and chronic digestive inflammatory illnesses. Inflammation, here's that word again, it's the body's natural response to pathogens and wounds. But when we're persistently eating something and we have a low-grade inflammation and continual activation of these immune cells through incessant exposure, it's going to be associated with a host of autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, cancer, autoimmune disorders, on and on we go, including depression. So also, all these grains, they have something called anti-nutrients in them. They plant, all of them, these uh, grain seeds and legumes, they have anti-nutrients that are coatings on the seed. And what they do, they actually help these seeds to survive so that they can, through drought or through flooding, they still, their seeds are intact and they can grow. So these anti-nutrients that coat the seeds, they produce toxins that damage the lining of our gut if we don't soak and sprout and ferment them. They also produce toxins that bind essential minerals, making them unavailable to our body. And three, they produce toxins that inhibit digestion and absorption of other essential nutrients, including protein. So this is a big deal. We are mostly looking for non-GMO when we buy, but indigenous people and many tribal and, and even people up to 100 years ago, they soaked, they sprouted, and they fermented their foods. So this is a really an important thing. And I think that if we do eat cereal grains, we need to discuss how we're going to utilize our grains. So www.sproutpeople.org has a great info on grain and legume preparation for the highest bioavailability. It tells you how many hours to soak your legumes, how many hours to sprout. It talks about fermentation. Um, I will tell you that compared to meat, seafood, vegetables, fruits, and fruits, grains are a poor source of bioavailable nutrients. So I really recommend to people to stay away from this high carbohydrate, high glucose type food, and instead get back, stay back with these other foods, go with an ancestral diet where you're getting higher protein and higher fat content. Now, each of these modules I'm doing here are 15 minutes long. So I just want to tell you right now that we've got about 30 more seconds here, and then I'm going to be ending this video and I'm going to go into module two. So um, if you want to go back over this at your own leisure, I will be talking further in the next video, in the next module, further about the second. We were talking about number one, cereal grains are the first diet fail. Then we're now going to go into industrial seed oils and what those are. Now, in the future, I will be going into greater depth about cereal grains, etc. But as I said, I want to give a brief overview and talk about these three things that are so vital for keeping your health good. So I'm going to stop this now and I am going to be going uh, into the next uh, module and I'll see you there at module number two.